Hi everyone, let's make a start. Uh, welcome, first of all, uh, to the London Machine Learning Meetup. This is actually the 91st London Machine Learning Meetup. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, we have Mike Lewis from Facebook AI Research, who's uh, going to be talking about representation learning and natural language processing. Um, I'm Martin Goodson, I'm one of the organizers. Uh, I'm, I, I work at uh, Evolution AI, who are sponsors of the meetup. Um, Mike is going to talk for about 40 minutes. Um, Mike is happy to take questions during his talk, so um, feel free to put your questions into the QA um, and raise your hand, uh, and then we'll call on you to ask your question. If you don't raise your hand, um, we can ask your question for you, but we would much prefer you to raise your hand and ask your question yourself, um, and we're much more likely to, to call on people who raise their hands. Um, so yeah, do, do ask questions during Mike's talk. Uh, if you have anything that that you want clarif um, clarification over, um, but also we will have a QA at the end if you want to, to leave your questions to the end. So I think that's all I have to say right now. I'm going to hand over uh, over to Mike. Thanks, Mike. All right. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, um, the invitation to speak here. So yeah, in this talk, I want to talk about some recent work on unsupervised representation learning for natural language processing, which has really been kind of revolutionizing the field over the last couple of years. Um, yeah, so just to like motivate this, uh, I'm going to start out with this kind of um, metaphor from Jan LeCun about where we use learning as kind of this cake. So there are kind of three layers to this cake. At the top, we have the, um, the cherry on the icing on the cake, which is kind of, um, which represents reinforcement learning or learning from interactions, which is kind of very powerful in general, but um, is also very expensive to run in practice, particularly with natural language. And um, when you really get supervision for task rewards, you get very low learning signal per example. Um, then we have the, the icing on the cake, which is kind of supervised learning or task dependent learning. And really, like until a couple of years ago, this is basically all we had. Um, so here you kind of get um, maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of um, labeled examples of the task you want. You try to imitate these. Um, and this uh, works pretty well, but um, gathering this data is very expensive, or can be. And there's still like not that much signaling, just a, a label on a piece of text. Um, but really, the focus of this talk is going to be on um, the kind of the main cake, uh, which is represents unsupervised representation learning. So here we're going to be trying to learn about natural language without any labels at all. Um, and the great thing here is that we kind of have an unlimited amount of data for this, and the, there's a very dense learning signal. Um, I mean, just trying to predict what words are used where and why. It's like um, you have to learn a huge amount about language in the world in order to be able to do this well. So I want you to face like this. It's uh, the point isn't so much that um, we shouldn't do supervised learning or we shouldn't do reinforcement learning, but really they're going to work a lot better if we can build them on a really solid foundation of unsupervised learning. Okay, so and that's where the uh, kind of theme of this talk is going to be trying to make it so we have more cake and less icing. So really trying to like reduce supervised learning to as thin a layer as possible on top of uh, representation learning. Um, that's gonna give us models which get dramatically better results than were possible before with supervised learning alone. Um, it's gonna open up NLP to a wide, wider range of tasks. And um, we'll see in some cases we can push to extremes of doing things, some tasks zero shot or few shot with them, um, no labeled examples at all. Um, one of the themes in like how we're going to do this is going to involve trying to uh, decouple knowledge about language from knowledge about the world. So kind of linguistic knowledge and factual knowledge, we'll be trying to treat them kind of separately. And I'll talk about that in a lot more detail later. And yeah. Okay, so for a quick recap of pre-training so far, um, up to about 2018, really all we had was um, unsupervised word embedding. So the most famous example of this is a uh, word to Beck from uh, Thomas Mikulov. Uh, but there was actually uh, 
very important work, maybe wasn't appreciated at the time so much by Carl Byrne Weston, who also uh, did pre-training for word embeddings. And here basically what you do is you um, try to just predict, given the context, try and like fill in the gaps or predict what word would fill in uh, the gap given the surrounding words. And you'd learn uh, word embeddings like this, and you, then you plug these into tasks. And um, this kind of often gave modest uh, gains in some tasks. Um, kind of the, uh, possibly the biggest breakthrough on top of that was um, the Elmo embeddings from Matt Peters. Uh, so Elmo instead predicts context-wise word representations, by which I mean, rather than just like learning one embedding for a word, which we'll use wherever. Um, it would um, learn to predict word representations based on the context. Um, this is actually a very simple approach for doing this, where basically they just took uh, left to right and right to left language models and just concatenated the representations you got from each of these. Um, then I think the next big development here was came from GPT um, from Alec Radford, um, where they kind of showed that you could just use Rather than just using these um, architectures uh, to give you embeddings, which could be fed into other tasks, um, they just actually pre-trained the whole language model left to right, and then just fine-tuned the language model per task. So didn't actually add any more parameters when you fine-tune your model for a new task. Um, but uh, then I think the, kind of the big revolution in this was um, the BERT model from Jacob Devlin, um, which has like really totally changed the field since it came out. So this is actually conceptually very simple. It's actually not too far away from a word to back. Basically what you do, the main task here is um, you take some sentence, you mask out some of the words, and then you just try to fill in the blanks given the other words. And you train a, a big deep transformer model like this. And then it turns out you can fine tune this for any task you care about, and it seems to work extremely well. Uh, the main change compared to um, GPT here is just that the model is bidirectional. So um, rather than being a left to right language model here, it just takes in um, word representation condition on both the left and right context, which turns out to be extremely helpful. There's also kind of another task where they kind of like should permute the order of sentences and try to predict um, which order they should be in, but I'll show that's not actually that important. Okay, so um, after that, we um, saw about some work we did. Um, so the first thing we did when we saw this was we were kind of exactly these results and tried to see how far we can take it. Um, all we did really in this work called Roberta was we uh, removed the next census prediction loss, which didn't actually help. We just, and then just scaled up the amount of data and the amount of compute. And we found this just kept on getting better. Like the longer we trained this for, the better the model got. Um, so really just scaling up seems to be extremely effective. Um, so here are some results in a couple of benchmark tasks. It doesn't matter too much what these are, but um, they're very competitive benchmarks. And we found that, um, you can see in blue here, we've got um, the sort of pre-BERT state of the art. Um, in green, you show the big jump we get from applying BERT. And then just like uh, this reverse technique of just um, scaling up more and more, uh, just keeps on monotonically improving the results. Um, so we were kind of amazed with all these results and uh, we actually found we were getting superhuman performance on quite a wide range of tasks. And, um, at this point in the point, it starts kind of worth asking the question, like in terms of NLP, like are we actually done here? Is there, should we just sort of stop trying to do new research and just leave the training for longer and um, it'll just keep on getting better? Um, so I think there's a few reasons why not. And we'll, um, one is that say this BERT model is just a classification model, but it doesn't actually like generate new text, which is important for many applications. Um, it's um, the reverse model only works in English so far. Um, 
also the models don't get quite big and inconvenient to deploy. And still we're actually, despite the success here, we're still quite dependent on having lots of label data. So all a reverse model really needs knows how to do without fine tuning is just how to fill in blanks, which isn't actually very useful for anything. Um, so it's actually very dependent on having lots of labeled annotated data to do fine tuning on to actually get a useful model out of it in the end. And then finally, the question I'm kind of interested in is like, is this mass language modeling the best way to pre-train? Um, so kind of filling in the blanks is definitely incredibly effective, but I think it's still an open question as to whether that's the only way we can do this or even the best way to uh, pre-train models. All right, so um, in spirit of answering some of these problems, um, we had a paper uh, at the end of 2019 called BERT, which ra rather than trying to just pre-train um, classification models, we actually want to pre-train models which work well for generation as well. Um, so the framework we adopt here is basically, um, you can do like take some text, corrupting it in some arbitrary way, and then training a sequence sequence model to try and reconstruct the original given the uh, corruptions we apply. And this is kind of interesting because it lets us, um, with this kind of view, we can actually do anything we like to the input text for corrupting it. Um, so at the extreme, you can actually just completely just destroy the input and then you basically have a GPT style language model, but you can do uh, more interesting stuff as well. And this is going to let us train models that can, we can use text generation to, so tasks like text summarization. Um, so it looks very much something like this, where you have some text, which we'll corrupt in some way we like. We'll feed it into a bidirectional encoder model, which you can think of as something like this. And then we'll have a autoregressive decoder model, which um, attends over the encoder representations and tries to predict what the original text should be. Uh, we tried a bunch of different tasks doing this, including um, token masking, which looks quite a lot like the original BERT objective. Um, we tried just deleting tokens. So the model here has to not just um, guess what the missing word is, but work out where words are actually missing. Uh, we tried like document rotation, where essentially we force the model to try and figure out what the start of the sequence should be. Um, we also tried just permuting the sentences in a random order, so the model has to try and figure out um, given sentences, like how to rearrange them, and like kind of learn some more kind of high level discoursey um, knowledge about language there. Um, also tried um, what we call text infilling, where Rather than just um, replacing single, masking out single words, we mask out spans and replace them with a single mask token. So this kind of gives you something where, um, given the single mask token, the model has to work out whether anything should fill in there, and if so, how many tokens actually need to go there. I'm just draw these mask lengths from a Poisson distribution. Um, so. Uh, for comparing these models with state of the art, it's actually kind of tricky these days. Um, so pre-train is kind of the wild west these days in that like there's lots of labs who are all working on this and everybody's working on different amounts of data and computers and high parameters. So to try and do a fair comparison, we uh, re-implemented a bunch of uh, popular recent approaches. Um, I'm not going to describe what all of these um, models are, but they're pretty representative of all the uh, recent things people have been proposing. Um, and in, yeah, what we found here is basically on tasks like question answering, we found that um, things that look like masking work really well and things that involve just things like permission sentence order and things are less successful here. Um, and also left to right language models don't work so well on the question answering, which has also been found in other work as well. Um, we also try this on uh, generation tasks as well. So here I'm showing perplexity numbers, so lower is better. Um, and here we find a slight different story where uh, just vanilla masking actually doesn't work so well. It seems like you need to 
mask longer sequences during pre-training to get better results. And we found that the uh, infilling object we use work quite well. All right, so having done this, we then scaled up the experiments then through uh, 1,000 GPUs at this for a while. And then um, we try fine tuning our various benchmark tasks. Uh, the first thing we find is that um, our BART model essentially gets exactly the same results as the reverser model on uh, classification tasks, which is all that reverser can really do. But when we apply it to um, other tasks like sequence sequence models, sorry, like uh, text summarization, we find that um, because BART can also generate, we also get new state of the art results on uh, summarization benchmarks by uh, a good margin. Uh, here's another summarization benchmark. Again, we improve quite a lot. Um, we found even that um, people prefer, we did human evaluation here too, and we found that people prefer the summaries generated by the BART model to the human generated references about a third of the time. So it's not like superhuman yet, but it's like um, getting to the point where we can expect superhuman performance on these type kinds of tasks in the next couple of years, I think. Um, it also outperformed um, a previous state of the art model based on BERT by a, a wide margin. Um, here's an example, um, which I quite liked. Um, so uh, this was like just in the news like the day before uh, we published this. So um, this, this at the top here, we have like a news story. It's about, um, uh, I think, this person, Anne Skoulis, who apparently was in some car crash and of course, kind of diplomatic incidents. Um, and we can see in some way the model generates bottom, which says like Boris Johnson said he'll raise the issue of Anne Skoulis' diplomatic community with the White House. Um, you can see like to actually generate this kind of summary, the model actually needs to understand quite a lot about language. Um, so for example, um, there's a bunch of co-reference here. So um, in the reference, it talks about Boris Johnson saying in the quote that I will be raising it personally myself with the White House. Whereas in summary, it kind of resolves that co-reference saying that Boris Johnson said he will uh, raise the issue himself. Um, some more co-reference there. Um, it's also kind of, uh, brings in some kind of interesting world knowledge as well. So for example, we see here that um, the source document doesn't actually ever mention that the Prime Minister Johnson is Boris Johnson, but the model has learned this from pre-training. Um, there's another example of that kind of thing here where it's talking about, the article's about uh, someone running a marathon in two hours. I'm not gonna try and pronounce the name, but the model actually correctly fills in their complete name, which isn't in the source document. Um, and um, we see some like interesting re reasoning here as well. So for example, the article talks about um, someone running, some of the marathon time being one hour, 59 minutes and 40.2 seconds. Whereas the uh, model is able to summarize that saying less than two hours. So we can see the model actually is able to like do some quite interesting transformations on language to produce, produce these kinds of summaries. And it's learning all this just by unsupervised representation learning. Okay, so to wrap up this um, work, we talked about BERT, which is a um, sequence sequence model, which we pre-trained by just applying arbitrary noise and trying to reconstruct the original. Um, we find that this gives us um, safety art performance on a range of generation and classification tasks. So this makes it a very general and powerful model you could use for um, many applications. Okay. So going back to the list I mentioned before, um, now we can pre-train models which are good for both classification problems and text generation problems. Um, we also need to think about how to make these work in languages other than English. All the work I've talked about so far has been just purely in English, but obviously um, there's lots of, it's super important we can make these things as general as possible. Um, so it turns out like, these techniques generalize an extremely straightforward way to other languages. Um, literally, 
we have this project called we have MBIRT, which is a multilingual version of BERT. And literally the only change we made here was that we, um, rather than just training the English text, we threw in text in other languages too. And so what happened. Um, so the algorithm here is applied with uh, no changes. Um, just the uh, trained data has changed. Um, we find when we do this that we it works very well. So here um, we're showing results for BERT when it's trained um, on a machine translation task um, in lots of different languages. Um, so I think this model understands 25 different languages. And um, when we find tuning from machine translation, it uh, consistently outperforms a random initialization. So it shows that the pre-trained knowledge we learn is actually useful for machine translation as well. Um, we try these things on the task too, and basically it works very well. Um, it seems like these kinds of techniques are not just tied to English and work. Um, for at least all the languages we tried. Okay, now can slightly change gears a bit and think about how we can control kind of the size of these models. So, um, currently our models are getting very big. Um, so these models I've talked about so far are maybe, I think they're about 500 million parameters. Um, since then, people just kept on pushing and pushing the scale. And I think uh, there's recent models from Google which are over a trillion parameters now. Um, so scaling up seems to work very well, but um, obviously has some kind of practical drawbacks in that uh, it's very expensive to train these models. And also, um, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to deploy the models to. So um, if we have a, I mean, model with trillion parameters, it's not something you can really do inference with practically um, without having uh, hundreds of GPUs just for the inference. So first of all, I want to take a kind of step back and think about trying to think about why these models might be, need to be so big. So what language models actually really need to learn? So um, imagine you can a language model and you're trying to predict the next word here. So we've got things like Barack Obama's birthplace is in and you've got some and you've got to guess the next word. So in clearly to do this, you need to know something about a bunch of stuff about language. You need to know you know, um, the next word is probably going to be a noun. It's probably going to be a place or location. If I need to know stuff about the kind of the underlying predicate argument structure. But also if you want to like predict the next word is say Hawaii or Honolulu, then you actually need to know more than knowledge just about language. You need to know kind of encyclopedic knowledge about the world, so like entities and relationships and facts. Um, so when we just pre-train our language models on the internet, then um, we're kind of like entangling these two types of learning. Um, and I kind of want to make an argument that these things are quite different and maybe they should be treated differently. So particularly like encyclopedic knowledge changes very quickly. Um, maybe, uh, if you're modeling the news, that's going to change all the time. Uh, there's just kind of infinite amounts of it. No one knows all the world's facts. And to some extent, then it's kind of encyclopedic knowledge just requires brute force memorization, and there's not a lot of generalization that's possible. In contrast, like, um, I mean, languages do change, they change very slowly. Um, and they allow an incredible amount of generalization from the data people have seen to new data. Um, uh, I kind of want to make an argument that you don't need to learn that much. There's not that much knowledge you need to learn to kind of know everything about a language or, or stuff that's kind of normally useful. So even fairly young children know a huge amount about language, even if they don't know encyclopedic knowledge. So I kind of want to make a case that we should try to disentangle these two as much as possible. And I'll try and show some techniques for doing that in the rest of this talk. Um, I'm gonna argue that we should model encyclopedic knowledge by um, kind of non-parametric memories I'll describe. I try to like just focus on linguistic knowledge using a new kind of paraphrase based pre-training. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about some work um, we did on nearest neighbor language modeling. 
where we'll show how to improve language models with a non-parametric memory, which will give us a big improvement in performance without any additional data or parameters or training. Okay. So, let's quick, because um, we're a bit short in time. Um, but basically, um, there's kind of an argument that what transformers are probably doing, which is some evidence, they're essentially learning key value memory. So they learn feed forward layers. If you know transformers, they have um, essentially a um, key value memory where they kind of try to match patterns that's training set and try to predict the next with it. Um, and this leads to people like increasing the size of their feed forward layers from very large to try and memorize very large numbers of patterns. What we want to do is try and replace this kind of key value, implicit key value memory from the feed forward network with um, a nearest neighbor classifier, which so the nearest neighbor classifier is another way of making a key value memory. Um, but um, it's one that doesn't actually require training. So what we're going to do is um, try to cache out a large amount of text by encoding it with a transformer and then saving the representations and saving what the next word actually was in the context, um, in that context. So and then we can use this for inference by just Rather than using the standard feed forward layer and the transformer, we're going to try and uh, look up uh, in the non parametric memory what the nearest paths we saw on training set were and what the next word was. Okay. So, to go through that in a bit more detail, we're going to first of all just train a normal language model. Then, we're going to cash out the training set. And then, test time, we're going to give some test time pattern. We're going to try and find similar training patterns. And, use the next word that happened there. So if you know what, a training set may contain a bunch of um, statements like these about like um, facts about Obama. Um, we're actually training Wikipedia, so it does actually contain text that looks like this. Um, then we're gonna sort of decompose these into sort of prefixes and next words. And um, we'll call these contexts and values. We're going to get embeddings to the context based on um, just feeding them into a transformer. Um, then test time, we're going to see some new sentences like Obama's birthplaces. And we're going to try and guess what the next word is here. So we'll take a transformer and encode this test context too. Then we're going to compute the similarity of this test context to um, all the context we saw in our training set. And we'll find that. Um, because our language model is magically good, it will find this context is similar to some training contexts more than others. And then we're going to like look, convert this distribution of training contexts into uh, a distribution of what the next word is should be, should be based on just uh, marginalizing out this distribution. And then we'll use that for our final prediction. I really kind of the intuition here is that. Um, if we do it like this, then our model doesn't actually have, need to memorize all these facts. The model doesn't need to like store in its parameters where exactly a family was born and where like every person in Wikipedia was born. It can instead just like learn how to index into a cache of knowledge, which is uh, kind of represented in text from the training set. And we hope that kind of learning similarity between two contexts is an easier learning problem for the model than learning how to um, that's actually saving these facts in its parameters. Um, when we did this, we found actually we got some really remarkably good results. Um, so this is a very competitive language modeling benchmark. The numbers here are perplexity, so lower is better. And we found that um, taking a state-of-the-art model, we um, actually improved it by well over two points by just adding this nearest neighbor model to it. And then that really gives evidence that these models are kind of, they're trying to memorize facts, but they're, they find this difficult. And we can just help them out by just um, allowing the models to learn representations and then relying on separate non parametric memories to learning the actual. And we found this just scales very well. So it's just like as you increase the number of neighbors we retrieve from the training context at test time, um, results to improve monotonically with no obvious limits yet. 
Uh, we also found that this is um, a very effective domain adaptation. So we found that um, if you took a language model that we trained on Wikipedia, um, and then we, you apply it to a corpus of books, it does very badly because it doesn't know anything about books. But if you apply a books-based data uh, cache, then um, we see really dramatic improvements in complexity there. Uh, we found a really interesting result where we found that um, building a cache over a large corpus can actually outperform even training on the corpus. So um, in red here, we have a, a model trained on 100 million words of Wikipedia. And in black, there's a model trained on 3 billion words of Wikipedia. And then in blue, what we're showing here is that as you take the model trained on 100 million words, and you just increase the uh, size of the uh, cache it has access to at test time. Um, at some point, this actually outperforms uh, training the model on this text. Um, and so this, I think, gives a really interesting path for scaling up these models. So rather than just like continually training on more and more text, we can actually train a relatively small model and then um, just improve its performance by uh, using these nearest neighbor classifier techniques. Um, um, yeah, um, so just to give a positive example of where this kind of thing helps. Um, here's an example of the original language model had struggle on the, um, the right here, um, on the left. Um, so it's talking about some like obscure, very obscure factual knowledge about um, some person called Joseph Warbreak who did some kind of uh, tour of the British Isles in the 19th century. Um, and the base language model is very confused about what the next word should be here. But the when we combine this nearest neighbor classifier, it's able to actually index a very similar example of the train set, which is talking about exactly the same events. And it's very confident it can actually just copy the word from the training set here. And um, it's almost certain that we get the correct prediction. Um, all right, so what this tells us, I think, is that um, explicit memorization and generalization aren't actually, don't contradict each other if you do it right. So we often think of like memorization, generalization as being kind of um, some kind of tension to each other. But um, really, if we kind of use, try to memorize facts using non-parametric memories and use the transformers instead to learn uh, similarity functions, then um, they can work together very well. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna very quickly, because we're a bit short of time, talk about some more ways we can use non-parametric memories. Um, so we also have this work called retrieval augmented generation, where um, basically we try to do knowledge intensive text generation by retrieving other bits of text. Um, so, um, hey, we'll do things like question answering by rather just like storing the answer in the model, we're going to try and retrieve some relevant Wikipedia text and use that to help generate the answer. And we find that a range of benchmarks, then um, this approach we call uh, RAG or retrieval rents generation, uh, really outperforms uh, work that just tries to memorize these facts in the parameters and giving more evidence that. Um, Retrieval and like non-parametric memories give a really good way to help out the models with uh, factual knowledge. Okay. Um, finally, I'm just gonna very quickly go over some new pre-training work we've done. Um, where we're trying to do representation learning using this kind of retrieval techniques at training time. The idea is just to help the model learn only kind of paraphrasing information in the parameters and have it like, not even try to learn any factual knowledge at all at pre-training time. Um, so goal here is really going to be a uh, learn to paraphrase. The framework, this model we call merge looks something like this. What we're gonna do at training time is we're gonna input some document on the left and um, looks something like uh, this Wikipedia article about Bama. Then we're going to try and retrieve a bunch of related documents from um, uh, the rest of our corpus, um, which relates to this. And we'll use a model to do this, such that 
we retrieve documents which contain the same facts that are expressed differently. And then our pre-training objective mainly is going to be to try and reconstruct the original given these facts. So the idea here is these then documents retrieved contain talk about the same information, but express it in quite a different way. And this means that we can, by learning to reconstruct the original, what you really need to learn is learn how to paraphrase. Um, so for example, here we can see um, these two bits of text talk about a lot of the same things like about mean 44th president, but they um, express these facts in quite different ways. Um, and we're gonna do this multilingually. So these things we retrieve don't even need to be in the same language. And we're just going to view say Chinese as being like an extreme version of paraphrasing English or vice versa. Um, to do this, um, our retrieval model is going to be very simple. We're just going to encode the documents with the transformer and um, take the code sign similarity between document representations. Um, and kind of remarkably, this worked even from a random initialization. Um, and then our reconstruction model is going to look something like that, where we just uh, have a sequence, sequence model that tries to reproduce the original given the concatenation of the input documents. Um, and we just like bias the cross tension by the in the seek model by the similarity score from the retrieval model. And this lets us actually do the back propagation end to end. So we can learn to improve our retrieval model uh, based on the reconstruction objective. Okay. So the nice thing here is this is like a single um, unsupervised training object, objective that actually contains a lot of, looks a lot like a lot of end tasks we actually care about. So things like reverse and BERT don't really look like any tasks we care about. Whereas this kind of objective, like um, the capture of the elements like multi-document summarization, uh, things like machine translation, because retrieval is different languages, uh, tasks like information retrieval, and um, more generally paraphrasing. So the idea here is really we build a, uh, pre-trained tasks it looks like a lot of tasks we care about so that we can get away with less supervised data for fine tuning. Uh, I'll quickly go over a bunch of results. Um, so basically, yeah, it's modeled merge forms very competitively with a bunch of other models. Um, this is on a retrieval task. Um, we got to do state of the art results on uh, text summarization tasks in lots of different languages. Um, it also works great for things like uh, question answering and uh, paraphrase detection. Um, an interesting thing is also you can actually do things with a raw model even without fine tuning it. So um, here, um, we can take the model and use it as an unsupervised translation model of documents. Um, and we find that in some language it works very well with blue scores as high as 35. Um, and this is without seeing like any explicit by text at all or um, any form of label. Um, so there's an example of translation here. And uh, the model is like given some German and like I showed the reference translation above, but we just talk about uh, an interesting way of talking about people going to Mars. And, um, I don't know whether it's a good like backup plan for humanity. You can see the um, unsupervised translation is very good. Um, it's kind of paraphrased a bit, so it's like not a very literal translation, but um, it's definitely caught all kind of the online gist of this without seeing any labels at training time. Um, and you can try this in other languages too. It kind of works in Arabic as well. Uh, the Chinese translation is less good here, but uh, it's still, you can kind of get the gist of it. So um, let's wrap up quickly because I'm out of time already. Um, so really it's kind of pre-training by a paraphrasing approach. I think it gives us the first kind of effective way of doing representation learning for language without just these variations in language modeling. And I think this really lets us get, um, by designing tasks for pre-training, which actually look closer to our final tasks we care about evaluating on, 
Um, we can get um, really effective results for zero shot learning and transfer learning. And fine, try to get away from relying on lots of data, on lots of labeled data. Sorry. Okay, so to kind of wrap up conclusions for Stark, um, I think it's fair to say that like just scaling up models and the amount of training we do and the amount of uh, compute we use is just extremely effective for pre-training. Um, and that's not going to stop. But we can try to like limit the um, overall cost of the training by using non-parametric memories, which kind of prevent the models from having to memorize so many facts. And I also introduced this new pre-training technique based around paraphrasing, which I think gives a kind of quite an exciting alternative to mass language modeling that um, really kind of brings pre-training and the tasks we care about close together. All right, and I would like to thank my uh, many, many collaborators who did most of the work that I've just uh, described here. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, and yeah, now I'd like to invite some questions from the audience. Uh, I'm going to introduce my colleagues, uh, Alessio and Giuseppe, um, also from Evolution AI, uh, who are going to be running the discussion um, and calling up people to, to ask their questions. Um, so yeah, over to you guys. Uh, OK, uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, your talk. Very interesting. Um, and I encourage everyone that has any question to use the Q&A uh, functionality to ask them. And if you want to ask it yourself, which would be much better, please use the raise hand button. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a question myself. Uh, uh, so you uh, say, like one of your examples um, about birth says, uh, like you showed that, uh, they could paraphrase and say that one hour 50 was less than two hours. And this was an example of reasoning, uh, which uh, so it, it, that, that's very interesting. But do you think that the model has actually learned how to reason about that? Or has it just found, you know, another a similar example where it, it said less than two hours? Uh, um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's a uh... I guess it's maybe hard to draw a line between reasoning and just memorizing here. I mean, certainly training these models at a large scale, so it's quite possible they do see examples like that and are able to um, memorize them. Um, I don't actually know how you draw a very clear line between can I, can I, um, you, um, I can follow up on that. I, uh, can you just kind of construct some in, input text where you have different kind of times in there, like two hours mm. and one minute, two hours and two minutes, uh, you know, one minute and 57. Isn't it quite yeah, strong? I mean, it, like, it's, it's quite a strong claim. Fun. It's quite a strong claim, isn't it, uh, about reasoning? Um, but it's a hypothesis, really, that it's fairly easy to test. Um, sure, yeah. I mean, um, I didn't actually try playing around with this particular example. I'd be, um, I would bet that it wouldn't say that if you give it um, a time above two hours for this. Um, I think, um, let's see. I mean, almost certainly it seems some kind of related examples to this in its training set is able to learn them. And um, probably you'll see some kinds of generalization here, but um, I doubt it is perfect. I mean, I mean, when I say reasoning as well, I certainly don't mean it's like doing some kind of like mathematical reasoning that like knows how to uh, compare like any numbers that will work in the, like a very general way. But I think, um, it certainly seems to involve some kind of inference to go from one hour, 59 minutes to less than two hours. Um, it's not like a totally superficial way of modifying the text. So I think uh, this kind of behavior is kind of interesting and certainly um, 
I think it's some way beyond what we could see in these kinds of models a couple of years ago before it's kind of work. Actually, are, are the models are like trained models available so people can play around? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, so this particular model, um, you can probably try it live if you want. Um, I think um, uh, it's very widely used. There are various demos available online for this. I think Hugging Face have a demo. Um, I'd be curious to know what happens if you try this. Um, uh, I suspect if you try it some marathon time, there'll be some confounds with like what it thinks a reasonable marathon running time yeah. is and things, but um, it'd be interesting to see what happens. Hmm. All right, thank you uh, for your answer. So uh, Elko uh, has a question. He has raised his hand, so I'll allow him to ask it himself. Uh, Hi, Mike. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, really interesting. So maybe I didn't understand totally how your, your first example of non-parametric memory worked. So huh. in, in the example you gave, so Hawaii was given uh, basically like a memory location based on its context. But um, does it still need, does the model still need to memorize the relationship between Obama and Hawaii to to be able to generate the right context to pick out that um, part of the memory? Let me see if I can. Um, so what the model really needs to, the model doesn't need to memorize that. It does need to learn kind of a similarity function that lets it say that, it needs to learn that um, Obama's birthplace is, is a similar, gets a similar representation to you like Obama was born in. Um, so really, it does need to memorize, say, birthplaces and was born in a similar in its representation space. Um, so that's stuff it does need to learn. But beyond that, um, as long as we build similar representations after these, it doesn't need to memorize the kind of the, the actual fact as to what the next word should be. Does, does that, that make sense? sense? But does it have to then give some kind of preference to the proper noun? Obama to make sure that that's really prominent in the like so is it basically like so these the context from Obama was born in and the context from Obama is a native of are changing are both changing as you train uh yeah so so the, the, the sort of the memory location of Hawaii is changing as you train is that sort of how I should understand it um right so we didn't actually even do any training for um so this technique is applied after training. So what we do is we just train language models normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we run it on a bunch of text. And we see what representations the language model has learned um, kind of during training. And it's not obvious why they should do this, but it turns out they do learn that kind of similar phrases end up with similar representations. Um, so in the language models embedding space and Obama was born in and Obama's birthplaces happen to end up with similar representations. Um, and um, even if the model is like, couldn't like memorize what the next word should be, it can at least learn to map similar context to similar parts of the representation space. And we can exploit that to help us, um, or really to help out the model um, by using kind of turning it to this kind of nearest neighbor classifier. Uh, did that help? Yeah, I think I, so, so, sorry, I'm maybe taking up too much time. So it's, it's basically, so then it's like, after you've trained in a sort of a more conventional way, then this is sort of a different way to tackle the same, the next word prediction task that gives a, a better, a better uh, performance because it- Exactly, yeah. So we got like a really big improvement in performance from applying this technique to an already trained model. Which I think kind of gives evidence that this is something the models are actually really struggling with when you use train conventionally, and maybe maybe this is why the models are ending up being like hundreds of billions or trillions of parameters these days because they just have to try and you have to try and cram the, all the world's knowledge into the parameters. What we're trying to show here is like there's different techniques you can do that avoid needing to train on all this text and have models which are quite so large, and you can still. Um, help them out with this factual knowledge. Got you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks.
Uh, okay, uh, we have a lot of questions to go through. So, um, Angus also um, asked a question with the racist hands, so I'll allow him to ask his, his question himself. Hi, Mike. Um, I was just wondering, in relation to the graph illustrating size of fact cash versus performance uh, that went up to like 3 billion cash, um, do you have any analysis of the inference time for the 1 billion model um, with the 3 billion cash uh, versus the 3 billion model? model? Uh, and, or is it just the training time that's saved that's the main advantage? Yes, yeah, it's a great question. I should probably talk about it some more. Um, so the kind of the, the downside to this technique is, um, is dramatically more expensive at inference time. The exact time depends a, a bunch on exactly how many neighbors you're retrieving from the training set. Um, so really, you can think of this as a way of like, um, this like dramatically reduces the training time and dramatically increases the, the inference time, but also works better in some cases. So um, it's definitely not for free at this stage. I mean, people are working on ways to try and make these things a bit more scalable um, at inference time, like nearest neighbor searches, so like a big research direction. Um, but yeah, I can do. Thanks. That's, that's great. I, I actually have one quick follow up as well. Sure. Um, so, so it also relies on you having the entities tagged in your corpus, I guess, so that you can extract the, the kind of corpus of facts, um, with uh -huh. the separate previous kind of section and then the answer. A uh, good question. Actually, we don't do that. So actually what we do is we just then uh, tag every word. So, uh, a data store contains like every context in the whole training set, so up to 3 billion entries here, which is partly why it's so slow. Um, and I think your question hints at like a, a very sensible research direction here, which would be to find ways of um, only storing the kind of the stuff that's actually useful. Um, here we could just take the brute force approach and store everything. Um, Presumably, if we could like filter the corpus to only store the more useful factual things, maybe then uh, it should work as well, and maybe it would be way faster for actually doing the inference with. But uh, here we just brute force it. Great, thanks. That makes a load of sense. Uh, okay, um, there's another question from uh, Sean. Um, it says that it seems like giving your model a cache of knowledge that it can work from, let's focus on the actual linguistic task it should be mm -hmm. learning. Were you able to reduce the parametric capacity of the model when you let it use this knowledge cache and it did reach similar performance? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, we didn't, I guess we didn't try reducing the capacity of the model. I mean, what we more found is that for the same capacity model, the performance improved, um, which will, I guess we take as evidence that uh, this helps. Um, uh, yeah, we didn't play around with like this, but I mean, certainly a hope here would be that you could get a model which gets close to the kinds of levels of say GPT-3 with um, hopefully orders of magnitude fewer parameters in the actual model, which maybe make these things a bit more practical or at least reduce the training costs, something uh, more reasonable, but we haven't actually experimented with changing the capacity uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, Yamuna also has a question, so I'll allow them to talk and ask it. Hi, Mike. Thanks uh, for the great talk. Um, I just had a question about zero shot learning. So, usually mm -hmm. that seems to be what's uh, being used uh, for translations. Mm -hmm. And um, so, that's my understanding would be that you take a, say, if you wanted to translate from English to German, then you would take English, then you would encode it, there would be an embedding, and then you use that embedding to do the decoding with the German oh. decoder, right? Um, so, normally when you do that encoding, then you are learning from a context from the corpus of English, uh, English corpus, for example, right? Um, so, but, but the context in which that word appears could be different in English, whereas it could be different in a, another language, right? Um, the, the reason I was asking is also because recently Google translated uh, unworried to unmarried in most Indian languages. Um, 
It only did it in Indian languages for some reason, and it did not do it in other languages. But it was across all most of the Indian languages that they did that translation. Um, I'm just wondering how how that could have possibly been, uh, you know, how that could have possibly come to. I mean, the, the only way I can think of is maybe English translated. Uh, sorry, the English encoder encoded it to a word embedding that was very similar to probably unmerit because maybe it was in the context in which it saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it translated that to all the other languages. Um, but that why wouldn't that do for all the other languages like German and French and stuff like that, if it was doing that. So- uh, Sorry, I didn't quite I'd hear your example there. What was the word that got mistranslated? Unworried. Oh, unworried. Huh. Unworried to unmerried. Interesting. Um... Yeah, I mean, I other, than, uh, other than the model having a sense of humor, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so I, I, I was just trying to understand how, how that could, how that could be, you know, how that could have possibly come to happen. Uh, unworried is an uncommon word uh, to use even in English, right? I mean, you would mostly use something like not worried uh, rather than unworried. Um, yeah. Um... Um, but but uh, yeah, it was just... It was just uh, confounding that it uh, translated that word into unmerited for a lot of Indian languages at the same time, but then why does it didn't do that for the other languages? So. Yeah, I, um, I don't know that particular example. You often when you look at these weird translations, um, sometimes there's like a, you can see a, at least understand the reason why they're doing that. Um, no, so I was just wondering in the case, I mean, should you then make sure that the context in which the word appears in a certain language, should you worry about, you know, when about that when you are translating it to a different language? Uh, because it might not. Appear yeah, I mean, um, there's definitely all kinds of issues with getting weird biases in your models from like the way we train them, what we actually want to do aren't always the same. I mean, uh, so, I mean, you often get these things like models like trying to infer gender for people in translations based on what they saw during training, which doesn't, um, but maybe isn't actually present in the uh, source text. So um, I think they are trying to make translation models more faithful to the original, like stop them try trying to overly use these contextual clues, which is definitely important. And mm -hmm. um, it seems to be a big cause of mistakes uh, these days. Yeah, but I thought it was interesting that, the, and they also were able to fix it very quickly, which was also surprising. So. Sorry, I didn't quite catch up. Uh, they also fixed it fairly quickly for most of the languages uh, within, a, within a few hours. So that was also surprising how they were able to fix it so quickly. Uh, um, yeah, I honestly, I don't actually know uh, how they're updating these models. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so, um, I'm going to show it here. We actually have some work on like applying these uh, non-parametric models, like that uh, language model, to machine translation as well, where it also works very well. Okay. And one of the advantages there is you can actually kind of like hot swap in new training data mm -hmm. or new data without training the model anymore. So, if your model is making mistakes like that, um, you can just you say expand you can... its cache with like a, an example how to translate something correctly and. Uh, so tr like sort of fine to fine train it basically sort of. um you don't actually need to train it anymore in this kind of oh, case okay. which is quite nice because because it just has this memory i see uh, you can like just update the memory and like give it examples or remove some example that seems mm. to be causing the problem so i think that's another way we can go about these kinds of problems right thank you thank you And uh, I think think that's it. We uh, ran over time. Uh, there are uh, there's a lot of questions in, in the QA, so uh, unfortunately we weren't able to go through all of that. Uh, but thank you, Mike, for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, and this will be uploaded on, on our YouTube channel uh, in in a few weeks. Um, yeah, thank you for this. Thank you very much for having me to speak as well. Thanks, guys. And uh, just to say, um, as Alessia said, uh, everything, all of our talks are uploaded to the YouTube channel. If you want to get notifications, then subscribe to the YouTube channel or um, connect to us on Twitter. I'm at Martin Goodson.
thanks again so much to Mike. Fantastic talk. And thanks everyone for the questions and, and for the uh, discussion. Um, thanks to Alessia and Jason. Take care, guys. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.